Well, welcome to this CG webinar, and it's great to see so many participants coming in. Uh, we have a very interesting topic um, with Yu Ting Shen and uh, Yanzhen Zhu, and Lily Yang will be the discussant. And our topic will be about the relationships, the comparisons, the differences, the synergies, the intersections, the interpenetrations, and the in interpretations through different lenses of Chinese thought and Western thought. Uh, and what a great and important topic that is, um, one which has preoccupied us a number of times in our webinar series. Before I introduce our speakers properly, let me take you through the webinar protocols. Well, at this point, I'm really happy to turn over to our two speakers and discuss it. Uh, Yu Ting Shen, who will open, is um, at the University of Hong Kong in Faculty of Education as a PhD candidate. Yan Jin Zhu, who will speak second, is, has exactly the same status. She's also at the University of Hong Kong, PhD candidate in the Faculty of Education. And following the, the, these, the presentations from Yu Ting and Yan Jin, we'll then have commentary from Lily Yang, who is a UHK assistant professor. Uh, and of course, someone fairly well known to the webinar audience, I think, uh, in the sense that she's presented now several times in our series, been an active participant uh, on many issues, particularly on the on the East-West comparison in higher education. So without further delay, um, Yu Ting, the screen is now yours. Thank you for the introduction, Professor Martinson. Let me share my screen. Can you see it in full screen? We can see it in full screen. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it's our great honor and pleasure to present some findings from our doctoral research. Around the topic of this webinar, my presentation will highlight the significance of incorporating traditional Chinese knowledge in research from the perspective of intellectual pluriversality. Yan Zheng's presentation will focus more on how to transform Chinese intellectual traditions. I hope you find our presentations help you understand the latest perspectives and academic efforts of Chinese scholars. Let's get started. Here is the main content of my presentation. The first section discusses Chinese humanities and the social sciences research in global knowledge asymmetry. As we all know, globalization brings intense knowledge exchanges in recent decades. So knowledge workers need to constantly learn and understand others. However, globalization also brings the epistemic and the cultural violence of Western centrism. This has silenced and delegitimized non-Western knowledge Several theories, including the Southern theory and the center periphery model, have provided critical reflections on this global knowledge asymmetry. This study understands intellectual pluriversality as a further step. It advocates for breaking constraints of the Western epistemology and realizing a coexistence of diverse epistemologies. Humanities and social sciences research is typically worthy of attention. Compared to science and technology, humanities and social sciences subjects are more socially and culturally based on the indigenous context. Most of them have their traditional roots, which were overlooked in global knowledge asymmetry. In recent decades, non-Western scholars gradually realized the limitation of Western dominated epistemological framework. So they have a growing awareness of adopting alternative intellectual resources, such as their traditional knowledge, which may promote intellectual pluriversality. Chinese scholars in the humanities and the social sciences are facing a similar situation. Traditional Chinese knowledge is not easy to define. Its vast body of knowledge is based on Confucian learning. More details about Chinese intellectual traditions will be discussed in Yan Zheng's presentation. As noted, traditional Chinese knowledge 
can be revived today as global resources. This viewpoint is also demonstrated by my empirical evidence in the following sections. My research question focuses on scholars' recent attempts in dealing with Chinese and Western knowledge, especially promoting mutual respect and understanding. This is a precondition of realizing intellectual pluriversality. The research findings highlight that incorporating traditional Chinese knowledge is one of the initial and effective steps in this process. This study borrowed some methods from phenomenological research methodology. 20 participants were interviewed. Thematic analysis was used in this study. Here is the participants' basic information. We selected scholars according to the distribution of age groups, subjects, and areas. Finally, we get in touch with 20 interviewees. Pseudonyms are given to each participant. Let's move on to the second part, the role of traditional Chinese knowledge. According to participants, revisiting traditional Chinese knowledge is a response to the epistemic injustice in global knowledge transfer. In general, there are two forms of promoting mutual respect and understanding between Chinese and Western knowledge. The first one is interactions in international academic mobility. The second one is exchanges through academic works. Participants noticed that Bridging Chinese and Western knowledge has been an ongoing process for over 100 years. In terms of direct bridging through human interactions, participants thought international academic mobility has been so easy to realize in contemporary globalization. Chinese researchers should reflect on their own critical imitation of Western norms and practices in internationalization. In terms of indirect bridging through academic works, participants agree that this process has also been occurring for the past over 100 years. Much Western knowledge has been transported to China through translation works. Many humanities and social sciences subjects are a product of bridging China and the West because they are so different from the ancient practice. Some participants pointed out, Chinese humanities and social sciences academics are far less knowledgeable about traditional knowledge than they are about Western knowledge. In part, this was resulted from the long period of anti-tradition before 1990s in China. In this case, most participants suggested it is time to share Chinese perspectives and knowledge in order to truly achieve two dimensional exchanges between China and the West. During this process, delving into traditional Chinese knowledge plays an essential role. On the one hand, participants suggested academics should engage in more international activities to increase China's global cultural impact through their traditional knowledge. On the other hand, participants focused on providing alternative discourse based on local knowledge in internationalization. It appears that Developing local Chinese scholarship serves as the foundation for their international academic influence. 
such discourses aim to move beyond the Western epistemological framework and the theories and contribute to the global knowledge system. In this case, how scholars bridge Chinese and Western knowledge in research by incorporating traditional knowledge is crucial, as will be articulated in the following section. The part three is about the directions for incorporating traditional Chinese knowledge in knowledge production. Due to the westernization of China's educational systems in modern history, participants were primarily trained to conduct Western-style research. Most of them recognize the importance of revisiting traditional knowledge afterwards. This process was the initial phase of bridging Chinese and Western knowledge. It was marked by leaning towards one single tradition in research. In order to advance the conversations between two knowledge, participants not only advocated for comparative research, but also promoted dialogues in theories and methodologies. They also took a further step to synthesizing two knowledge at the philosophical level. Participants in philosophy demonstrated the greatest willingness and academic efforts in developing theories. Their research at the ontological level plays a fundamental role in this process. This is an overview of Chinese academics efforts based on the empirical evidence from my thesis. Incorporating traditional Chinese knowledge is an initial and important effort in each step. In this section, I focus on the very first step in this process, revisiting traditional Chinese knowledge. More details about traditional paradigms, theories, and methodologies will be elaborated on in Yan Zhen's presentation. To revisit traditional Chinese knowledge in this stage, participants emphasize the three general principles. The first principle is to view traditional Chinese knowledge based on our modern time. For example, look contented. We should think about what can be reserved from Chinese culture what really can be brought to modern life or what can be connected with our present life. This participant, Sam, commented, let's see if these traditional ideas can survive the modern shock and be reborn of fire under the modern impact. If they can't rebirth, then they die, but at least let them have a try and perhaps they will lead to some new ideas which I think there is some possibility. The second principle is to gain an authentic understanding of what traditional knowledge was really talking about while having different epistemologies. In fact, there are two epistemologies in this regard. One is about a neutral and objective perspective. This participant argued for finding the truth without bringing in a certain framework. He regarded seeking the truth as similar to solving a law case. The other one is about a compassionate understanding of traditional knowledge. This participant argued for doing research out of some value concern. He thought empathizing with ancient wisdom can facilitate the comprehensive understanding of traditional knowledge that was more morally oriented. The third principle is to selectively adopt traditional knowledge in research. Participants emphasize the identifying different levels of traditional knowledge. 
including using culture units and a disciplinary perspective. Culture units like a small tradition, large tradition, and the subcultures. From the disciplinary perspectives, this participant think, on the aesthetic and the philosophical levels, we may need to preserve and inherit more. So there are different levels and we should identify the small units to analyze. In conclusion, my research brings Chinese scholars' latest efforts in bridging Chinese and Western knowledge on the table. The perspective of intellectual pluriversality helps us in resisting epistemic injustice. It further helps us to use traditional knowledge in non-Western societies as alternative resources for global higher education. Here are my references. That's all for my sharing. Thank you. I will pass my floor to Yan Zhen. Okay, so thank you very much, Professor Rajin Zanili and Pahan for having me here. And nice to see you all. And also thanks Yuting for your really fantastic presentation. Uh, so let me share my slides. Okay. Today, I want to share part of my thesis findings about the pains and gains of China scholars during transforming Chinese intellectual traditions into explicit knowledge. My report includes five parts. In the second part, I'll briefly introduce my theoretical framework. Then I'll move on to what I found from my empirical data in the third and fourth parts. Yuting has highlighted the importance of world intellectual pluriversality and the Chinese traditions. For my report, I want to add that it's not easy to incorporate Chinese intellectual traditions as modern and global resources. China's modern higher education has been constructed with twisted roots, and the underlying cultural conflicts between Chinese and Western values are still challenging. He says, if we look at modern Chinese intellectual history, we can say that it's just an arduous process to integrating to integrate East and West. Generations of China's intellectuals have been struggled to achieve this goal with little success. Even today, where to position Chinese traditional values in China and the world still remains a tough task. My research is a tentative exploration of how Chinese intellectual traditions function in China's modern higher education. Or to put it in another way, how China scholars deal with or transform Chinese traditions in the modern higher education system. And I attempt to answer it both theoretically and empirically through literature review and a qualitative investigation. Then I want to introduce the three resources for my theoretical framework. Firstly, the general definition of Chinese intellectual tradition is still absent. So I synthesized Edward Shields' understanding of tradition and some common grounds in extensive English and Chinese literature. In my research, the Chinese literature Chinese intellectual traditions refer to the stable and adaptable patterns that guide the actions of China's intellectuals and have roots in Chinese indigenous culture. Methodist mainly focuses on scholars who are generally seen as a part of intellectuals. Secondly, I borrow Michael Polanyi's explicit and tacit knowledge. Explicit knowledge is public, objective, and can be set out in written and known from artificial forms. So it is widely acknowledged as knowledge by the scientific and ac academic world. Passive knowledge is unformulated and preverbal, so it may appear to lack the essential quality of knowledge. Actually, I'm not the first person who uses explicit and passive knowledge to discuss traditions. Edward Shields said it tacit knowledge to explain tradition in his book. Thirdly, some Chinese resources can also support explicit and tacit knowledge. 
one version of their Chinese translations are Yan Chuan Zhi Shi and Hui Yi Zhi Shi. It comes from a sentence in Zhuangzi. Zhuangzi describes the meanings of Dao as implicit or Hui Yi, which is used to translate tacit knowledge. On the opposite, Yan Chuan, which literally means transmitting in words, is used to translate explicit knowledge. Besides, the Dao Qi binary can also echo explicit and tacit knowledge to some extent. Dao Qi binary comes from the classic of change, Yi Jing. It classifies two forms of extents. Dao is beyond specific forms, and Qi is with specific forms. During data collection and analysis, I found that six out of 28 participants used Dao Qi and explicit and tacit to explain the situations of Chinese traditions. This greatly inspired me to adopt explicit and tacit knowledge as a theoretical lens. So I designed an iceberg model to illustrate my theoretical framework. One participant said, traditional Chinese values exist tacitly in the living world, just like an iceberg under the water. I borrowed his idea and made some adjustments. In my research, Chinese intellectual traditions guide China scholars in two manners. On the one hand, they can be patterns guiding the professional knowledge production of scholars. In this way, scholars transform Chinese intellectual traditions into explicit knowledge, which can be categorized into modern knowledge and recognized by the higher education system. On the other hand, they can be patterns guiding the daily lives of scholars. Scholars transform them as tacit knowledge, which is hardly noticed and acknowledged. Today, I mainly report on how Chinese intellectual traditions are transformed into explicit knowledge. There are three explicit forms of Chinese intellectual traditions drawn from my empirical data. The first form is approaches. In ancient China, there were three mainstream approaches to traditional learning, evidential investigation, moral philosophy, and writing. Evidential investigation, kao zheng, or kao ju, refers to examining Chinese classics critically and always on the basis of textual evidence. Moral philosophy, yi li, refers to establishing Confucian moral principles chiefly through metaphysical speculations and interpretations. Writing, si zhang, means skills of literary expression and stylistic excellence. My data shows that 15 participants still use the three traditional approaches and make some modifications. Kao Zheng is combined with textual criticism, and Yi Li is usually associated with manuatics. Participants employ the two approaches to analyze many kinds of texts and documents, not only Confucian classics. Si Zhang is mentioned as some writing genres, like dialogical genre and biographical genre. The second form is methodologies and paradigms. Today's methodologies and paradigms are mainly from the West, but eight participants want to change this condition by developing traditional Chinese resources into methodologies and paradigms. I list some examples here. One participant uses the Tao of Yin Yang as his methodology to translate Lun Yu in his papers. And he argues that this methodology can contribute more to Chinese English translation. Another participant thinks that anthropologists should be reflexive and empathic besides knowing empirical methodologies. So putting oneself in the other's position, in Chinese, they say tui ji, ji ren, in Chinese traditions can serve as a helpful methodology. And an archeologist emphasizes the importance of traditional Chinese epigraphy, jin shi xue. Jin shi xue is a tradition of antiquarian scholarship. It combines the historical, epigraphic, and calligraphic values of antiquities. This participant thinks it can be a paradigm in reaching China's and world archaeology. 
The last one is series. 14 participants build some series based on traditions. Some of them extract series directly from traditional resources. Here, the examples are two education researchers. Their papers argue for the theoretical value of five Confucian virtues, what Wu Chang, and moist ideas for moral and scientific education. Some participants uh, theorize Chinese traditions as counterparts of Western theories. Here, I want to emphasize that they don't want to replace Western theories with Chinese theories. Instead, they want to provide some alternative perspectives and bridge East and West. A good instance is the theory of great unity, Da Tong. It is a Confucian political, social, and ethical ideal in ancient China, which championed a harmonious world where all people are brothers and all things are companions. In his paper, one participant promotes the dialogue between the theory of great unity and cosmopolitanism. Many participants are leading scholars in China, and some even enjoy an international reputation. But they also said that they have faced a lot of difficulties and challenges. First, participants think the Western-oriented mindset is still ingrained in China's academic circles. China scholars rely too much on Western scholarship, but know too little about Chinese traditions. Not many people are aware of the value of traditions. What's worse, sometimes Chinese traditions are misunderstood as unadvanced or unscientific. So participants said their ideas are not so easy to be widely understood and accepted, let alone to be as popular as Western theories and paradigms. Besides, rigid all this culture demands high publication productivity and unified standards. But participants said innovative works based on traditions are more time consuming, but harder to publish. So it's usual to yield half the results with twice the effort. In Chinese, they say ban, And the unified standards often require them to follow existing research paradigms and writing formats. But participants think it's unreasonable to cut the feet to feed the shoes. In Chinese, they say They think academic journals should be more open to innovative thoughts. Internationally, participants are traveled by language barriers and epistemic bears. Most participants find it challenging to convey their ideas in English, especially when they want to introduce Chinese traditions they find that cultural baggage behind the language makes translation more than intractable. Some participants who can skillfully use English also admitted that they feel pressure because bilingual writing demands double efforts. But for them, the biggest problem is not language, but epistemic bias. One participant developed his theory of aesthetics based on Chinese traditions and has published some English papers and books. He said one editor from a famous international journal asked him a series of questions, like, is your theory just Chinese local knowledge? And what's your contribution to world aesthetics? He finds it needs more time for Chinese theories to be accepted globally. And another participant told me his story about teaching Chinese philosophy in the philosophy department at a German university. During his teaching, he faced many challenges from students. Some students said, okay, what Confucius said makes sense, but I don't think it's philosophy. But this participant also said he could understand why some students think so, because in the Western context, philosophy is an old discipline and exclusively means Western philosophy. Finally, I want to echo what Yu Ting shared about intellectual pluriversality. Yes, it's true that many challenges and difficulties are still there, but participants are optimistic to grasp the nettle. In recent years, there is a growing awareness of traditional culture in China. Universities, schools, and other social organizations are paying more attention to this issue. 
and international academic interactions are so common today, which is likely to promote mutual respect and understanding. They believe this makes it possible for Chinese traditions to contribute more to China's and world scholarship. I also want to say that it's a long way to go to achieve intellectual pluriversality, but each step can make us closer to it. So I hope the pains and the gains of China scholars I report today can be one step towards this goal. This is my reference list and that's all my sharing. Uh, by the way, I'm still working on my thesis and any comments will be very helpful. So welcome all questions and suggestions from you. Thank you. So if I may, I will be try to stay short. And thank you for the two excellent presentations, Yuting and Yanzhen. And it's my pleasure to share a few thoughts and comments. Uh, as the two presentations suggest, that we are facing global knowledge asymmetries and epistemic injustice, and there are continuing efforts on decolonizing and indigenizing knowledges in the global south. And among the various factors accounting for the asymmetries and injustice, more attention has been paid to the structural constraints such as the global journal and university ranking systems, gatekeeping of global top journals, the dominance of English at the global academic language, so on and so forth. What remain less known are the epistemological factors, in particular why and how certain knowledges are excluded in an illegitimate way from the global knowledge pool and how such exclusions influence and are manifest in non-Euro-American scholars' epistemic practice. Portuguese philosopher de Sousa Santos underlines the Western abyssal thinking that suppresses, excludes, and denies the possibility of co-presence of different forms of reality. Australian sociologist Cornell criticizes the exclusion of Southern knowledges and calls for de developing Southern theories. Asian scholar Chen Guangxing proposes Asia as a method. These all seem to suggest that a potentially powerful tool to challenge Euro-American epistemic dominance is taking in local knowledges and building pluralist frameworks for the co-presence of multiple knowledges. But this is not easy, as the two presentations have shown. There are many challenges. A major one for Chinese societies and many other non-Euro-American societies, as the new Confucian scholar Du Weiming wisely pointed out, is the existence of a collective amnesia, which highlights knowledge discontinuities in these societies, which also um, reflected in Yan Zhen's presentation. In other words, pre-colonial or traditional knowledges are being excluded and silenced by imported Euro-American forms of knowledges, both in research and in formal education systems. And in this background, explorations of how to incorporate traditional knowledges and connect traditional and the so-called global knowledges in research and how to transform traditional knowledges in the contemporary time become essential questions. And that's why the two presentations today are truly important and have much potential to offer in the pursuit of epistemic justice. And the two presentations merits are not uh, limited to the importance of the topics. They have provided firsthand evidence on the struggles, pains, attempts, reflexivities, and gains of Chinese humanities and social science scholars in dealing with the traditional Chinese knowledges and have suggested possible approaches to incorporating multiple knowledges. And this is a reflection of collective wisdom Chinese humanities and social scholars are offering. As a Chinese researcher myself, working in a highly internationalized environment, I personally have observed and can strongly connect with many of the findings. And in particular, for example, what international mobility cross-cultural experience can do, um, the epistemic bias and um, challenges and baggage carried by language, so on and so forth. And moreover, traditional knowledge's potential should not be limited to local societies. The world needs to draw on wisdom from the globe, from all over the world. And therefore, I would like to echo the arguments of making traditional Chinese knowledge as global resources and call for more efforts in conceptualizing the ongoing efforts by scholars across the world. And in the growing global uncertainties and common challenges, this will also contribute to mutual understanding and mutual respect across society and finding new solutions to the common challenges. 
in the end, I'd like to uh, use a quote from an African philosopher, Pauline Pontongji, to end my comment. Start of quote, the real issue today is how this so-called traditional knowledge can be actively critically reappropriated in a way that does not entail traditionalism, pacifism, or collective narcissism, but rather enables these societies to address the new challenge that faced them. End of quote. Thank you. And thank you, Lily, and thank you very much, Yu Ting and Yan Jin. Um, really not good presentations. Uh, and um, I guess the the discussion would would uh, be lifted if we could start to look at what the differences and similarities are. You know, most people, of course, watching this webinar are soaked in Euro-American view of the world, Euro-American disciplines. And I think that to, to be able to identify how a Chinese traditional approach might see something differently to a Euro-American approach, but equally usefully, if you like, equally explanatory, that would be very, some examples would really help the discussion, I think. Um, we need to pass from talking about knowledge in general to knowledges and particular applications of knowledge and so on to make this more real, if you like. Um, but let me echo um, the way that Lily finished and also what um, the way Yuting started, by, which was to say that Chinese traditional knowledge is a, a global resource. Um, and I think this uh, can only become possible if we we see tradition as not something in the past, but something in the present. And um, you know, if you, um, uh, I don't think there's any point in, in in going back to the past and undoing everything that happened since and trying to get back to some pristine original condition, because it doesn't work like that. We can only move forward. So the question is what we have in our environment that we're moving forward with. Now, the, I mean, the problem that you've had, I think, in trying to recover traditional Chinese knowledge is that for most of the 20th century and indeed into the 21st century in China, there's been a vigorous attempt to tear up and destroy all of the past and to start again, perhaps by then borrowing from the West and implanting that in China. And, uh, and this, of course, is a very Western approach to modernity. You know, the idea that everything's constantly, completely swept away and reinvented. When you actually look underneath the Western modernity and its successive waves of change, you find that actually a lot of the past is still there. And so it's a bit of a fallacy to pretend that, you know, you can, uh, you can that even the West eliminates the past. It, it has its tradition. It just doesn't always acknowledge it. It remains tacit and entirely tacit. But you know, the cultural revolution was destructive and why in the way in which it was, it was destructive was to adopt this super Western idea that you could just start again, you know? So this is a, uh, you know, and everything had to be destroyed, physically destroyed. Um, people had to be destroyed who embodied tradition. Um, and that was terribly difficult. Uh, and I, th I think that, um, you know, overcoming that um, is the challenge, but um, the, the, the strength of Chinese, epistemology has always been diversity you know this capacity to have many schools of thought many pa many pasts and past and present traditions all on the agenda and this was the great feature of the of spring and autumn and warring states periods you know this tremendous flourishing of different schools of thought and great ideas and um you know the the gcr academy you know with its you know famous bringing together of the different conflicting schools of thought and seeing what could be built from us from hybridity between them and um and or, or where the differences might still be useful um now the, so the question then becomes in chinese universities today is there enough space for this diversity i think there is in hong kong you you know i think you have that at university of hong kong you can bring together these different ideas together this is really important this little mini GCR Academy of Hong Kong U. Um, but is there is there scope to do that inside China itself? And I'm not, I don't want to get into a, you know, I'm not getting into a, you know, China bashing argument about authoritarianism and so on here. I I just really want to try and flesh out how much space there is for plurality. I mean, there's not much space for plurality in the Western disciplines in many areas. You know, you can, 
You can't have a, 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 an unorthodox economics in an economics department. It's almost impossible, you know, except in a few universities that foster a, a unorthodox economics. But, you know, so the problem of monoculture is not a Chinese problem. It's a Western problem. Um, but is there space in China to make it more plural, do you think? So who wants to answer that question? that controversial question. OK, I go first. Um, I want to uh, firstly anchor what we have in our current environment that can equip us to going forward. Uh, Sorry, someone okay. is interrupting us. Can we okay. leave Yu Ting free to speak, please? OK. Um, it's okay now. Okay, uh, I want to uh, elaborate on one point in my thesis in details. Uh, that's the uh, philosophy in ancient China. Um, ancient Chinese philosophy emphasized family affection. That uh, also reflects traditional Chinese culture, which value the relations relationships between people. So uh, in today's uh, globalization, we know we pay too much attention to the electronic devices in our era. Uh, we sometimes neglect the surroundings, the people nearby. So I think uh, sometimes the traditional Chinese philosophy that emphasizes family affection, the relationships can contribute as global resources for us to rethink about the relationships between people. Uh, one participant in my interview tried to establish family affection as ontology. It is uh, like ridiculous in the Western sense, uh, talking about philosophy. Family affection can never be ontology in the Western philosophy, but in ancient Chinese culture, family affection is so important, especially filial piety, caring for parents and the loving parents, following parents' hearts. It's really important. It makes sure the generations by generation, the race from a ethical ontological level. It also is a co feature of ancient Chinese culture. So I think um, perhaps sometimes we can look back uh, to see all oh, this point. Maybe we don't need to uh, exactly stick to the ancient virtue, stick the ancient rules. That may be outdated, but we can hold, hold the uh, epistemological level that uh, emphasizes relations to rethink uh, uh, the current uh, errors, um, maybe some weakness, some danger. So I think uh, we can find the strength from traditional Chinese culture. And uh, the second question is about the enough space for diversity in higher education. I think uh, it's also very interesting that uh, Chinese, China's higher education doesn't uh, uh, advocate highly for uh, diversity in the Western sense. But I think we truly have diversity. We just uh, don't label them in the Western sense. Uh, I think at this point, uh, maybe uh, need to have a long period living experience to uh, get this sense. Um, but I think uh, it's a different way of thinking. Uh, we d may not uh, judge, okay, uh, there is no diversity, uh, but we can try to dig deep to see um, in the Chinese sense, uh, in this culture, uh, what this culture function in this way. I think uh, it also can be another alternative discourse for us to rethink. I hope I have answered your question. <laughs> Okay, uh, I want to add some points. Um, first, I want I want to begin uh, from the definition of tradition. In you know, uh, this term just 
have traveled me for quite a long time. And from from the beginning of my um, PhD uh, research, and even now, I'm I'm still struggling for this uh, for figuring out this um, term. Um, but uh, now uh, I have some clues for understanding tradition. I absolutely uh, agree with Professor Marginson because I think intellectual tradition can't be understood as a um, solid or generic term, uh, at least for my research. Traditions are continuously changing, flexible and, and dynamic, and also shaped by our practice in the actions of scholars in my research. Uh, and every day, even now, we are creating new elements for traditions. But I think sometimes something rooted in history and culture are stable. This stable thing um, are still guiding the actions of, of people through generations, just like um, what Yuting said about the family um, effect in China. Um, um, and I think from my personal experience, um, especially when I enter when I entered um, university, I felt strongly um, the family effect on myself. Um, especially when I uh, enter the uh, university, uh, you know, um, maybe a more um, a place with more. Um, uh, autonomy and I can make more choice based on my own interest or my own experience. I found sometimes family of fact um, are still ingrained in my mind. Um, and I also want to say um, uh, that um, I really agree that um, tradition um, are past in present, but we need to find it from present to past. Uh, because uh, to some extent, I think today's people decide what traditions are and not Asian people. Uh, because for instance, if uh, one scholarly approach was created in Asian time, but no one uses it today, we can say it's, it's not tradition. Unless one day someone finds it, and then reuses it for his or her needs. So um, that's my basic understanding of tradition. And uh, that's also why I can observe how Chinese intellectual traditions function today by investigating works and experience of my participants. Um, and as for um, some traditions still e equips still equip Chinese people, I think, uh, because I have, I have introduced um, the explicit forms of Chinese intellectual relations. I want to share um, maybe one point from the tacit uh, form of intellectual traditions. Um, in my uh, data collection and analysis, um, some participants just mentioned um, one um, point and this tradition um, was is translated into uh, Confucian self-cultivation. In Chinese uh, um, it's called Gong Fu Lun. It is created by uh, 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 Song Confucians as a way to pursue the sagehood or ideal personalities through uh, deep reading or quiet sitting and meditation. Uh, some particip participants still practice it in their daily lives, and in, but their practice um, is not accepted by the modern education system and also the academic system. Um, but they are they are trying to find way to uh, to make more people or make uh, their students to know the. Confucian self cultivation or to practice Confucian self cultivation. Um, I think it, it may need more time, um, but um, maybe some in the future, um, someday, uh, I think 
uh, confusion, self cultivation can um, can provide more uh, inspirations um, for um, scholars in other countries, um, not only uh, non-Western countries. Maybe um, it can be a resources for um, people uh, to pursue the moral uh, improvement. So uh, that's my um, two little observation um, I, that I want to share. Thank you both. Um, uh, Yanjin, I think I see something like Confucian self-cultivation in a lot of places. Uh, and I think the thing which is, um, which is less clear and less common is the moral or ethical framework in which it's the process of self-cultivation is understood and you know which the self process of self-perfection is directed towards i mean i think i don't think there's as much consensus on that and that's another it's a, that's perhaps the thing which has been thrown into disarray in the modern period everywhere uh, and that's what we m maybe need to talk about a bit further i'm going to bring in uh, in this limited time we've got we're going to bring in people in batches because we've got a very active um, chat and call list and uh, everyone's been very stimulated by these three presentations. So Shadi D, Shadi D, you are first and I'm going to invite you in and also Gad Yeh and then Yiran Ma, HKU student. Um, so the three of you in order. So Shadi D, come in please. Hello Shadi D, are you there? Have we lost you? It, it does happen sometimes. People disappear sometimes, because, not for out of choice, but because they their uh, connection breaks. So, Gad, Gad, yeah, are you there, please? I am here. Thank you very much for uh, wonderful presentations. Um, from the picture behind me, you can understand that I'm studying science and intercultural differences uh, in doing science. And your presentation made me think about two issues. One is more classic uh, definition of center and periphery issues in science where we can say the South is not being able um, to contribute to science as, as scientists in the center, meaning in England and the US, for example. So people from Italy or Serbia uh, feel excluded in science uh, by not participating equally. So that one, uh, center and periphery, and the other one related is a classic book by Randall Collins. He's a sociologist of science too. And he has a book that, called The Sociology of Philosophies, uh, pointing out that even Germans and French people cannot fully understand each other because the world and Chang with the worldview is different. And there are problems of transferring philosophy, even in Western cultures uh, across countries. So these are two comments that um, um, you have notes or questions, whatever. Thank you. Now hold your response. I'm going to bring in uh, Yiran now, Yiran Ma. Uh, thank you. Hello. Thank you so much for your fascinating sharing. I'm Yiran Ma from Hong Kong U at Comparative Global Studies of Education. And my question is, can China enhance global intellectual pluralism by adjusting local accountability standards? And what challenges may appear due to both long-term local and global structural inequality? For instance, China can increase scholars' publication funding at local publishers, improve multilingual translation to spread local knowledge in global academic community and strengthen the weight in national university rankings of local epistemology grounded research about international common research topics. Thank you very much. Thanks for those precise questions. And you've got two questioners um, and you may choose between you, which of you would like to answer first? Go on, someone say something. Um, uh, let me explain. Uh, I also find other participants' uh, questions about Chinese and Western knowledge, uh, the binary thinking. Okay, uh, it actually... We'll get, to, uh, we'll, we'll get to the chat. I mean, I will get, we'll get through it. Yeah, yeah. Just respond yeah. to this first, yeah. 
Yes, uh, echoing, ec echoing the center peripheral model, uh, the Chinese and the Western uh, binary, um, they saying, uh, I think um, actually uh, this study is from the position of Chinese scholars to uh, use traditional Chinese knowledge. So uh, it's like uh, the, the description and the explanation of concrete actions taken by Chinese scholars. So I think the how it can be a further step from center periphery model uh, is embodied in these concrete actions. Uh, my empirical evidence shows how they do uh, at the epistemological level or in the epistemic practice like research. Uh, I also mentioned the philosophical research uh, about uh, the family affection. These are all concrete uh, actions to deal with the epistemic injustice or to resist uh, the center periphery model. You know, uh, if we always argue uh, and uh, stating the centrally periphery model, we don't um, Put, uh, go forward to concrete actions and substantial efforts. What I'm showing here is to show uh, Chinese scholars that has done something forward. So uh, this is for the first question. Um, and the second one, uh, could you please uh, explain the local accountability standards? Uh, I, I'm not sure. Um, Yiran, do you want to repeat it. your question? Uh, maybe I, I can add a point about the central, uh, maybe the bi binary of East and West, because uh, in uh, during my data analysis and collection, I find this binary actually has been criticized also mm. by Chinese scholars. They think if we if we are always trapped in the uh, binary of East and West. Uh, may, we may we may have lost many beautiful thoughts from other non-Western countries. So, uh, some uh, one participant I remembered, he want to um, move one step, and um, so he he want to um, move one step uh, from the binary of East and West, and he actually um, use uh, the thoughts of Lao Tzu to research, uh, um, to conduct an anthropology research on a non-Western society. He said it, it's just the first step. It's just an uh, initial uh, exploration um, of um, about how Ch Chinese, uh, maybe Chinese traditional resources um, can contribute more to understanding non-Western societies. Uh, and um, also, um, I think maybe in the future, um, as um, the intellectual pluralism pro pro proceed, maybe um, more um, beautiful thoughts from all kinds of societies uh, across the world um, were intro are introduced, are brought in, brought on the table. Maybe we can have more um, interesting discussion on how to bridge all those um, beautiful thoughts in our research. I think categories are always useful for us, but you know, we, we, we have to change them when, when, when they need changing. And especially we have to jump out from them and not be trapped by them. And uh, we need uh, diverse ways of looking at things to understand the limitations of any categorization we choose. And uh, I mean, everything is partial, you know, but if we have plurality, then we have different visions of the of what's there in reality, and we can see more of it as a result. Um, I'm going to just bring in two more people before we close, because we're actually at the end point now, but we do sometimes run over time by about five minutes. So um, let, let's have the the voice from Korea, the um, an, another uh, really important nation in the Chinese civilizational zone. Um, and we have Terry Kim and um, Seong Lee. Um, on our list of people uh, and so I'll bring them in and um, and then we'll have to close I think the call list and I apologize to Yusuf and uh, Yusuf Oldak and uh, Steve T I think we we won't have time for you today um, Terry are you there please um, thank you Simon um, 
Thank you very much for the presentations. It is a very uh, thought provoking, a lot of food for thought. Um, I, as I put in my um, in my question in the chat box, um, I your presentations made me think um, how you define the global south and what is a thought on knowledge. And is this term already indicating um, binary thinking rather than what you call the pluriversality? And I think it would be important to define more clearly um, what you mean by southern and in juxtaposing China versus Western knowledge uh, tradition to compare. Um, I am wondering how you locate non-Western or, or non-Chinese knowledge uh, in your epistemic world map, um, and and it's I think it is important to think about the geopolitics of uh, knowledge hegemony, and 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 knowledge uh, production or reproduction, and then the, the role of China and the position of China in this. Um, it would be uh, hugely important for 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 us all, um, including China and the non Chinese. Thank you. Thanks, Terry. Um, Sayong, so you've got the last question. Yes, yeah, how lucky I am. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, my question actually echoes other, echoes other present other questions question. But what I'm thinking is I as an Asian, I really um, agree with your with the importance of epistemic justice. But at the same time, I'm worried if Chinese knowledge will just simply replace the non Western knowledge, which will replace just a non-Western plus um, Western idea into Chinese plus Western ideas, if you know what I'm saying. So yeah, just like it is very controversial as well, you know, for example, Chinese New Year versus Lunar New Year, something like that. So I'm worried about that. So I really um, am curious about your thoughts. And then second was, um, if I understood correctly from your um, presentation, it kind of implied that the value of Chinese knowledge is in not replacing, but providing this alternative views on Western ideas. But is there any independent or more autonomous or separate values um, in providing this Chinese knowledge to the global science? Yeah, that's two questions. Okay, uh Okay. This is your okay. final statement, I think, this, this answer, yeah. Okay, uh, so uh, maybe the non-Western no, non -Western and non-Chinese knowledge, um, uh, I have to admit that I am also troubled by the language <laughs> um, bar barriers, uh, not only between the Chinese and uh, English, but also uh, the Chinese and other languages, because uh, during my literature review, I really, I, I found many um, in, uh, discussions about their uh, intellectual traditions uh, in their societies in English. Uh, but um, it's, it's a pity that I can only read um, this literature in English. Uh, I'm, I'm aware of there are many um, maybe literature about uh, the maybe African, uh, in inter intellectual tradition or, um, ad or other intellectual traditions uh, or something like that. But uh, <laughs> I can only uh, guide the, I can only get the English literature. And I try to find some common grounds in this, um, um, maybe in this uh, literature about, English, about uh, intellectual traditions um, from non-Western societies. Um, so, um, um, I, um, so I think it's important to um, bring some um, other, maybe non-Western um, theories and ideas into research. Uh, and I also tried, um, and I also tried to do so, uh, but, uh, you know, I, I'm still uh, troubled uh, by the language barriers. So maybe, uh, so that's why I think we want to promote intellectual pluralism uh, because the maybe more communications and um, more in, in introductions um, will promote and promote the 
maybe uh, academic research and also um, can provide more resources uh, for us to understand um, um, no matter um, Chinese intellectual traditions or um, other non-Western non intellectual traditions, also Western intellectual traditions. Let me add uh, a little. Um, I think uh, the Western and the non-Western binary thinking uh, is uh, what we resist um, in this presentation. Um, but uh, what we use uh, these two concepts is like at the technical level uh, to make a distinction. Yes. So uh, what uh, our goal is to realize intellectual pluriversality without these uh, binary thinking. Uh, we uh, use our traditional knowledge as in alternative uh, intellectual resources is the initial step. It's a long way to go. So uh, basically and uh, practically we can adopt uh, traditional knowledge and which is closely related to our cultural identity, identity and ontological level. Uh, this philosophy um, this is the culture conflict the most. So uh, it's like uh, we need to tackle the most fundamental level first uh, in practice. Yeah. Lily, do you want to say anything at the end? Thank you, Simon. Uh, I know that I'm just a, I'm a discussant and uh, I'm not in a good position to say a lot in the Q&A session, but I want to highlight one point which has also been mentioned by Simon. Um, so it's the Chinese idea of diversity in unity. So it highlights and also the idea of uh, what Chinese um, traditional knowledge can bring to the world is not the hierarchical idea as manifest in the central periphery or the global north and global south idea, the binary idea, hierarchical idea, what the Chinese idea want to promote here is also the um, diversity and the non-hierarchical idea and also this moral aspect of, of uh, in the individual's um, self-cultivation and uh, enhancement. That's, uh, I think that is one of the most um, important uh, contributions of Chinese knowledge that can bring to the world in contributing to uh, global epistemic justice and plural diversity. Thank you. Yeah, well said, Lily. Uh, I think everyone is nodding and endorsing what you just said, uh, very much in the spirit of the whole uh, webinar. Uh, and thanks to you, Ting and uh, Yanjin. That was really good. I mean, you really opened up a lot uh, and uh, and showed us what you can do, which is good. Uh, so you can come back on our show again and contribute more when your doctoral studies are more advanced. Um, very, you had a really good participant audience today. I see uh, Jürgen Heinz and Ruth. Hey ho and others, senior scholars who are really important thinkers in our field and uh, have shaped many of us and continue to contribute uh, very much to the discussion. And also many uh, emerging scholars, many junior scholars are here as well, uh, who are really interested in this, these, these issues, um, you know, profoundly important for the future of the world uh, that we develop and enhance this dialogue. My only, my only closing comment is I think we need to move beyond generalities. You know, we're very good at this kind of bird's eye view of things it's a bit of a western habit actually and we need to get to some really good examples you know some really strong um, um, specific ideas like um you know sometimes poetry can make the point better than than uh, our social science prose you know that and sometimes sometimes illustrations and, and 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 images can also very strongly you know give us a sense of of diversity and otherness about knowledge so I, th I think that um, we can take the discussion much further, and we all will, in our publications, in our presentations, in our classes, in our contributions to public discussion, uh, and and to each other. So thank you very very much. Our um our next um webinar uh, on Thursday this week is going to be um from Yusuf Aldak, who was unable to come in unfortunately to the Q and A today, uh, and I'm sorry I couldn't bring in Yusuf, but we will hear from him. Next week, fans of Yusuf, you have not missed out altogether. You'll hear Yusuf on Thursday talking about tectonic shifts in global science. Um, US-China competition on, on one hand, but we have the rising Muslim science systems on the other and the way they're interacting with the big players. So Yusuf is developing a very diverse set of 
research interests and global science is now one of those. So we look forward to Yusuf on Thursday. And let me once again, thank you very much for coming today and, uh, and presenting so well. Bye for now. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.